Chapter 3 discusses two topics related to materials properties. Poisson's ratio tells you how much an object changes dimensions in different directions when a mechanical load is applied. The thermal expansion coefficient tells you how much an object changes dimensions when the temperature changes. Let's consider a block of material. It has a height, a width, and a depth. If we apply a tensile load along one axis, the block will stretch along the longitudinal axis and shrink along the transverse axis, crosswise to the loading direction. It's hard to see in a piece of steel, but very easy to see with a rubber band. We know from Chapter 2 that the longitudinal strain is the change in length divided by the initial length. Longitudinal strain is also called axial strain because it occurs along the long axis of the part. Transverse strain is the change in width divided by the initial width. If this part were a rod, we would define transverse strain as the change in diameter divided by the initial diameter. Since the width or diameter shrinks when you pull on the bar, the change in width or diameter is a negative number. Poisson's ratio is the negative of longitudinal strain divided by the transverse strain. Since transverse strain is negative, we end up with a positive number. It's a unitless materials property equal to 0 0.25 for steel, 0 0.33 for aluminum, and between 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 for concrete. You can find values for Poisson's ratio in Appendix B. The symbol for Poisson's ratio in most modern strength of materials books is the Greek lowercase letter nu, which looks a little bit like a lowercase v, but isn't. Older strength of materials textbooks use the Greek letter mu, which you know from friction problems in statics and physics. Here's an example problem of an elevator car suspended by a steel cable. We'll say the cable is equivalent to a steel rod with a half inch diameter. The car plus passenger weigh 10 kips, so the stress in the rod is 10 kips divided by the cross-sectional area of the rod. The stress is 50.9 ksi. We know from chapter 2 that Young's modulus is stress over strain, and in this case it's longitudinal strain. Rewrite the equation to solve for strain, and we get a longitudinal strain of 0 0.0017. Now we can use Poisson's ratio to find the transverse strain, which works out to minus 0.000424. We can use the transverse strain to figure out the change in diameter of the rod. The definition of strain is change in a dimension divided by its initial dimension. In this case, the dimension is diameter. We find that the final diameter is 0 0.4998 inches, which is two tenths of a thousandth of an inch smaller than the initial diameter. In an elevator, this amount of change doesn't matter at all. In a machine with moving parts, a small dimensional change could mean the difference between two parts that slide easily and two parts that jam, preventing the machine from working. The previous chapter looked at tensile loads applied along a single axis. What if we pull or push in all three directions? Pulling in the x direction only would cause the block to shrink in the y and z directions, but if you're also pulling in these directions, it will change the results. There's a derivation in the textbook that you can read. The result is a set of three equations for the strain in all three directions.
the first thing we have to do is calculate the applied stresses in the three directions. Sigma x is the force in the x direction divided by the face of the block that's perpendicular to this force, which is the side face of the block. It works out to minus 25 ksi, a compressive stress. Sigma y is the force in the y direction divided by the face of the block that's perpendicular to this force, which is the top face of the block. It works out to positive 30 ksi. There's no applied load in the z direction, so sigma z is zero. Now we can solve for strain. As you would expect, the strain in the x direction is negative, and the strain in the y direction is positive, because the block is being squeezed in the x direction and pulled in the y direction. What about strain in the z direction? As it turns out, it's slightly negative, but it could easily have been positive if the loads in the x and y directions had been a little different. You don't know whether z is going to be positive or negative until you run the math. This is why it's important to keep track of positive and negative signs in your calculations. The second part of the chapter focuses on thermal expansion and thermal stress. We all know that when a solid material is heated, it gets bigger. We can measure how much bigger it gets. Consider a bridge span that starts out 100 feet long. If the temperature increases 10 degrees Fahrenheit, a steel bridge will lengthen by 0.078 inches. If the temperature increases 20 degrees Fahrenheit, a steel bridge will lengthen 0.156 inches. A concrete bridge will expand almost as much as a steel bridge, but an aluminum bridge will expand about twice as much. What if the bridge is a thousand feet long? The result is that the bridge will expand a lot more. As you look at the table, you'll notice that the change in length depends on three things, the initial length, the temperature change, and the material. We can boil this down into a single equation where lowercase delta is the amount of thermal expansion, lowercase alpha is the thermal expansion coefficient, which you can find in Appendix B for different materials. L is the initial length, and delta T is the change in temperature. Anytime you have a change in a number, calculate it as the final value minus the initial value. If the temperature drops, then the final temperature will be below the initial temperature, and the delta T will be negative. This means that the change in length is also negative, which means you have shrinkage instead of expansion. Let's look at an example problem. A 20-foot long copper pipe carries water in a house. It starts at room temperature, then you turn on the hot water valve in a sink, and the pipe heats up from 68 to 130 degrees Fahrenheit. How much does it expand along its length? Find the coefficient of thermal expansion in Appendix B. Notice there is one value in Fahrenheit and another in Celsius. Use the value that matches the units in the problem statement. The pipe expands a little more than an eighth of an inch. This is why water, houses, water pipes in homes and commercial buildings are not fixed to the walls, but are instead allowed to move a little to accommodate thermal expansion. What if a pipe is embedded in concrete, preventing it from expanding when it wants to? We can think of the pipe as being like a cantilever beam that wants to expand an amount alpha L delta T. However, because the concrete blocks are preventing this expansion, it's like imposing a point load on the free end of the cantilever beam 
to push it back into its original length. The change in length from chapter 2 is PL over AE. Set the two deflections equal to each other and the length term drops out. We end up with a stress in the pipe that's equal to minus alpha times Young's modulus times delta T. Here are a couple of finishing thoughts on thermal expansion and thermal stress. The first is a cable that's stretched taut between two walls to a stress of a thousand psi. If the cable cools, what is the stress? Just add the thermal stress to the mechanical stress and that will give you your final answer. If you have two cantilever beams made of different materials that have a gap between them, how do you figure out the temperature at which they will touch? Let's say we know what the materials are, how long the beams are, and how large the gap is. The gap is equal to the thermal expansion of the two beams added together. Since they're heating up by the same value of delta T, we can take delta T outside the parentheses, and now you can solve for delta T.